So I would like to begin this dialogue by looking at poverty in the midst of prosperity and the challenge of inequality in Singapore. I believe you'd like to make some remarks. Sure. Thank you, Tommy. And it's uh, always a pleasure to be um, uh, in dialogue with Tommy. This is our third time, I suspect. <laughs> Can everyone hear me, by the way? Because I have my mic in the pocket. Can, you hear Can the I back? be heard at the back? It's clear? Okay. Um, so let me just say a few things uh, uh, to start the dialogue. Uh, inequality is important. Uh, social mobility is even more important. Uh, it's social mobility is at the heart and soul of our ambition. Uh, not just in government, but it must be at the heart and soul of our ambition as a society. It's part of our identity. It has been part of our identity, it is part of our identity, and it has, has to be at the heart and soul of our ambition for the future. But I'll make three points about this challenge of sustaining social mobility and managing inequality, making sure that inequalities don't become too wide. The first point I want to make is that it is critical that we sustain a system where everyone is moving up. In other words, before we think about the issue of relativities, which is what inequality is about, we have to think about the issue of how can we make sure that everyone moves up, including those in the broad middle of our society, the middle class. Because once that escalator stops, once that escalator that carries everyone up stops, the problems of inequality and all the problems of me against you, this group against that group, become much sharper. And this is exactly what has happened in a whole range of advanced economies. Once you get stagnation in the middle of society over a long period of time, which is what's happened in the US, it's happened in a range of other advanced countries, inequality becomes a much sharper issue, much more brittle. And the politics of inequality acquires a momentum of its own, which makes it harder to solve the problem of a broken escalator. Once that escalator stops, just imagine it, we're all moving up on an escalator. Once that escalator stops, then it becomes a very salient issue. Who's ahead of me? Who's behind me? And not just who's ahead of me and moving further away from me, but who's behind me and catching up with me? And this too is what we see in a range of advanced countries, that pervasive anxiety of people in the middle as someone is catching up with them and someone is moving away from them. So keep the escalator moving. Second reason why we've got to keep that escalator moving for everyone is that it makes it much easier to have social mobility with a moving escalator. There are more opportunities, there are new skills to be learned, new jobs to be obtained, it becomes much easier to achieve relative mobility when you have absolute mobility. What I get is not just at the expense of someone else. I can move up without someone else moving down if the escalator is moving up. So that's the first point I want to make. And Singapore's done relatively well by that measure so far because our median wages, the wages of those in the bottom 20%, have been moving up, unlike many other societies. The second point I want to make, Tommy, has to do with social mobility itself, which, as I say, has been part of our identity and must be at the heart and soul of our ambition. It will get more difficult. It is already more difficult, and it will get more difficult precisely because we have succeeded in the past, because we've had waves of mobility from a population that largely started off poor, like many in this audience, like ESM. It's an exemplar of that Singapore story. Mm -hmm. Start off poor, did well in education, work hard, do well in life. We've had waves of mobility. So those who were poor, or those whose grandparents were poor, 
had parents who are not so poor and they themselves now are no longer poor, are in fact quite well off. And they invest in their children as much as they can so that their children can do well. So it's in the, it's in the nature of a meritocracy, it's in the nature of succeeding in mobility that it gets more difficult over time because those who succeed try to help their children and those who haven't succeeded find that the odds increase against them doing well in life. And it simply means, and more so in Singapore than elsewhere, that we have to work harder at keeping mobility going. By starting earlier in life, in fact, I would say, starting in fact even in the prenatal months before a child is born, starting very early in life and continuing through life to intervene to help people to do well for themselves. Intervene to help people to do well for themselves. It requires a consistent effort in early childhood, through the school years, and in work life, investing in people at regular intervals, and taking very seriously the idea that everyone can grow. That growth mindset has to be what defines us. It doesn't matter where you start, you can grow and you can improve, and you can master your job. So this is a major challenge. Very few countries are succeeding. I just came back earlier this week from Finland. I was in D Denmark and Finland, both relatively egalitarian societies, culturally, and in their education systems. But they've seen social mobility far short of what they desire. In fact, the persistence of social class in even the Nordic societies is, is a, has been remarkable over the decades. Mm. And they are the most egalitarian of the, adva of the Western societies. We too will face these challenges. We're doing better than most societies for now in terms of mobility, but we're going to face more of a challenge. Yeah. And we have to focus our minds on it. The third point uh, I want to make when we think about inequality is we have to remember that a good part of inequality in Singapore is actually generational inequality. Think about it. And I'm not even talking about the pioneer generation. Even if you talk about those in their 50s today, say age 55 and above, of Singaporeans age 55 and above, the majority, in fact, well over 60%, had no more than secondary school education. These are people who are still in the workforce. They're not old mature workers in the workforce. Well over 60% had no more than secondary school education. But we succeeded in transforming education and transforming opportunities for subsequent generations, those born later. And that has led to a generational inequality. Those who started earlier with limited education, by and large, did simple jobs, worked hard, their pay has gone up over time, in real terms, it's much better than it was in the old days, but they are now at the lower end of the escalator. They're at the lower end of the escalator, and subsequent generations have moved up. That was success. It was success in transforming societies, but it has led to generational inequality. And we have to focus our minds on how we can help older Singaporeans, and I say older not meaning the the true elderly, but you know, mature Singaporeans <clears throat> who still have 40 years ahead of them, those in their mid-50s, those in their mid-60s, and they will have 40 years ahead of them, to work for as long as they wish, to work with dignity, to earn a decent pay with the support of the employers, with the support of the government, and with the support of the public, to be treated with dignity. I, by the way, I just... Just before I came up, I, I had to go to the loo. And I met a gentleman there. Yes. Dressed, uh, very, holding himself uh, with some pride, with his uniform. He was the attendant in, in, the, in the gents. And we had a chat. And I was struck by how good his English was. So it turns out, his employer, he started working here eight years ago full-time job, all the benefits, started off at 1,002, 
now earning well above 2,000. Employers sent him for training, including English language training with uh, Kaplan, even had to sit for a test, he told me, on the computer. He holds his, he's working as an attendant. He was very pleased to be of help. I didn't need help in the toilet, but you know, he was, <laughs> he was very pleased to be, uh, to be, to keep me company and to have a chat. But you know, he was doing his job with dignity and earning a decent pay, with pay that goes up over time. Employer takes him seriously and invests in him together with his teammates. Yeah, but, uh, and that's what it takes. But, but DPM, the important question is not whether he behaves with dignity, but whether people who enter the lab laboratory Absolutely. show respect Absolutely. and treat him with dignity. Absolutely. And I would say in Singapore, the elite does not show respect for people who work as cleaners, gardeners, patrol station attendant, security personnel, right. you know? The, so one of the problems in Singapore is these low-wage workers are treated as invisible people. You are one of the few gentlemen who greets him and talk with him. But how many of you did? I'm sure, well, the ESM did. Heng Chi, you can't be in a men's toilet, so. <laughs> so. So may I ask you the first question? So I, I, you but, finish your I, point? I, I think Tommy is right that ageism is still an issue in our society. Uh, and uh, ordinary blue-collar workers also deserve a lot more respect and regard. I don't think this is only a problem for the elite. I think it's part of our social culture. We inherited a combination of a, a set of British institutions and an East Asian culture. Uh, both of which were quite hierarchical, uh, both of which tended to look down on ordinary manual labour. Uh, and we've got, to, we've got to move past that. Yeah. Uh, and it means everyone. It means customers, it means uh, ordinary members of the public, it means employers critically. Employers play a critical role and with the support of the government. Um, th thank you, DPM. Thank you for those three uh, very important points. Um, my first question is about inequality and I would challenge your premise that inequality is a generational problem, you know, that, and that as the old people like me face away, face, fade away from the scene, the problem will disappear. It will not. Singapore has become increasingly stratified. We are unequal not only in wealth, in income, occupation, housing type, the school you went to, the way you speak. As um, Janil Puducherry, the documentary showed us, we live in a very class-conscious society. But I want to draw three things to your attention. One, the UN Development Program has a very well-respected index called the Human Development Index. The Human Development Index describes Singapore as the second most unequal high-income economy after Hong Kong. And within the space of two days, we had two different uh, reports about Singapore. <clears throat> on the 9th of October, Oxfam published its annual report on commitment to reducing inequality, and Oxfam was very critical of Singapore, demoted us from 69 to 140 something put us in the bottom 10 countries of the world. I, I think it's a very unfair report. But two days later, the World Bank published its first human capital index, and the World Bank ranked Singapore number one for the development of human capital. So my question to you is, how do you reconcile the UNDP's index that say Singapore is the second most unequal advanced economy, Oxfam report on us, and the World Bank's very salutary report in Singapore. Well, first, uh, 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 you're asking someone who does spend some time looking at these surveys and uh, the data. Uh, I actually like data. I, I eat data for breakfast. <laughs> uh, data with a little bit more data. So, um, and you can juice it as well, which uh, they say is, a, is uh, also quite healthy. Um, uh, 
Let me start by saying that I disagree with Tommy that we are one of the more class-conscious societies around. In fact, I'd say we are one of the... Uh, if you talk about our social culture, we are much less class-conscious than many other societies I'm familiar with. Partly because we are younger, we are at risk of becoming more class-conscious, uh, and we must resist uh, every tendency in that direction. So I just want to mention that point. Second, uh, I would say uh, uh, I myself didn't take the Oxfam survey very seriously, not because of his conclusions or anything like that. It, it, it's just it wasn't very good. It, it was very weak methodologically, and I'm someone who takes data and methodology uh, very seriously. It was not a good survey. So I don't want to spend time criticizing it either. Uh, but we do have a very interesting question of whether we should be concerned about the fact that by most conventional measures, the most conventional one is named after an Italian statistician, statistician called Gini. Mm. I don't know when he lived, but, uh, but uh, he's, he's become famous. You know? uh, everyone knows Gini because of the Gini coefficient. Um, and uh, by Gini coefficients, before you talk about government actions, taxes, subsidies, transfers, and so on, Singapore does not have an unusually high uh, level of inequality. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, quite apart from the US, which has a high rate of inequality, uh, and quite apart from the developing world, I mean, China and so on have much higher levels of inequality, even amongst uh, the European countries, uh, several, including the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. have a higher rate of inequality by Gini coefficients before taxes That's and right. transfers. Before transfer. And then what they do is they have very high taxes for the ordinary person, uh, a typical ordinary person would pay something like 30% income tax and about 25% VAT, uh, as, as many of you would know. And because they don't have too much savings, the VAT of 25% is actually a 25% income tax because you're consuming most of your income. So it's roughly a 50% tax on the ordinary person. In our case, uh, virtually no income tax for the person right in the middle. <clears throat> Uh, and you pay GST, 7%, and moving up by 2% uh, in a few years' time. Uh, and then if you own a car, which the average person doesn't, but you know, some do because they need it, uh, you pay a significant COE and you know, ARF and so on and so forth. Uh, but our taxes are far, far lower on the ordinary person, including the middle class, and the lower income group than any other advanced country. Only Hong Kong is in the same league, but Hong Kong, believe me, is living on borrowed time. Hong Kong is living on borrowed time. The property market is doing well for now, but Hong Kong is going to be an aging society like all of us, and they're going to need revenue just like we need revenue. So we are a low-tax society, and as a result, we have to think very hard about how we use those tax revenues. And what we do is to use it very progressively. In other words, target our subsidies and our benefits on the poorest in society, on those who need it the most. And if you're a statistician, and uh, if you know how the Gini coefficient is computed, uh, because we're not adding, we're not taxing the middle class a lot and then not throwing it back uh, across the Gini curve or throwing it back in the middle, we're just focusing it on the bottom the impact on the Gini coefficient is not as large. But that's a technical explanation. Never mind the technical explanation. The point is, we have a low tax regime that is highly progressive in terms of where the benefits go. So if you're a, someone in the bottom 20% of incomes, for every dollar of tax you pay, which is mainly GST, you get back about $4 of benefits, which is a very progressive scheme more progressive than many other societies, but at a lower level of tax. So that's our system. And where does it end up after taxes and transfers? Our Gini coefficient is something like 0 0.36, for those who are familiar with this, which is not uh, at the top end of the advanced economies. It's certainly in the top third, but not at the very top end. But critically, I come back to my first point. What matters is not just the relativities, but are people doing better over time? It's no point being better off than someone else if, in fact, everyone is stuck in the same place. 
And we have fortunately avoided a situation where you have middle class stagnation and where the lower income group is also stuck. Everyone has, has been moving up. The escalator is still moving. And we've got to keep it moving, which is why economic policy is fundamental to social objectives. It's not just social policy. It's not just redistribution and transfers and so on. Economic policy itself is central to our social objectives. How do we reconstruct Singapore for a disrupted world, as ESM put it in his speech? That's fundamentally economic policy. And if we can do that well, we keep the escalator moving for everyone. I think your basic point that um, upward mobility continues to be strong in Singapore is a good point, and I agree with that. Inequality and poverty are related, but they're not the same. So do you mind if I ask you a question about poverty? Please. Yeah. If you take per capita income, I think we are one of the five richest countries in the world. But there are many poor people in Singapore. There are two kinds of poverty. Households that live in absolute poverty, meaning that they lack the means to pay for basic human needs. And families that live in relative poverty. The concept of relative poverty is derived from um, taking 50% of the median income as their yardstick. Household whose income is below 50% of median income is considered relatively poor. From the research I've done, I found that there are between 100,000 to 140,000 households living in absolute poverty. And there are, according to Econ, 15%, but from my research, it looks like between 20 to 35% of our household living in relative poverty. So my question to you is, what, what are the facts that you have about poverty in Singapore? And what can we do to reduce the poverty in Singapore and make sure that people are able to live in dignity you know, and, and material sufficiency? So I, I, I share <laughs> the um, uh, aspiration that Tommy has laid out. You've got to make sure that everyone can live with dig in dignity, live uh, a dignified life at work as well as in the community, and see their lives improve over time. There are poor people in Singapore. Uh, there are some people who are, who are trapped uh, in poverty. And our challenge is to help them escape that situation. They themselves, their children, and with the support of the community and the government. And this is, this is a task. It's not an ideological task, it's a practical task. We've got to find every way possible to help them to escape poverty and ensure that you do not get a persistence of poverty across generations. And there's a risk of that happening. There's a risk of it becoming entrenched and passing on from one generation to the next. So we've got to work very hard at it and it's not an easy task because I know of no society that's actually succeeded. Uh, there have been many attempts, particularly in the last uh, 60 years, since the 1960s, in the US, in the UK, in Europe. Uh, the, if it's merely a question of redistribution, it improves your Gini coefficients, but it doesn't get people out of poverty. So how do you get people out of poverty? How do you shape social culture for the better? How do you raise aspirations amongst the young, even if their parents or their uncles and aunts uh, don't imbue it in them? It's, it's a task. It involves teachers, empathetic principals. It involves peers getting into a positive cycle of aspirations rather than a negative cycle amongst themselves. It involves all of us. So we have to work harder at this task prevent poverty from being entrenched. The numbers who live in absolute poverty are much smaller in Singapore uh, compared to elsewhere because our whole society has moved up. And you only have to remember what it was like in the old days. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not as senior in years as, uh, as Tommy is, but you know, I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. I actually remember very vividly what it was like. Um, even the in today's, 
if you talk about today's wages and today's prices, right? At today's prices, the pay of an average person when we became independent in 1965 it was about $550. It was actually much lower than that, but I've inflated it for today's prices, okay? $550. For a lower income person in those days, it was a couple of hundred dollars, $150, $200. And the lower income person then, compared to the lower income person today, those in the bottom 20%, the increase in standard of living adjusted for cost of living increases has been about five times, five times better off. So there are people who are struggling today, but think of where we came from. Think of where we came from. It has been a dramatic transformation and a dramatic transformation in the middle of society. So we have progressed, but we still have problems. And the problems that will always be with us are the relative problems. Because by definition, depending on how you define relativity, you will always have a proportion who are less well-off than the others. And I would not say that's irrelevant. It is relevant. Uh, we don't want relativities to get too, too wide because it just affects the tone of our society. Thank you, DPM. Um, DPM, before I take questions from the audience, may I briefly mention another challenge? We have the challenge of inequality, challenge of poverty. There's a new challenge in Singapore. And this is the challenge of growing intolerance. Um, a, a mutual friend of ours was recently invited by one of our religious organizations to speak at a conference on a secular topic. He accepted, prepared his paper, and then he was disinvited and why was he disinvited? Because he signed a petition to repeal 377A. You know, we can disagree, but there's no need to demonize each other. And I would also make a plea to the government to show greater tolerance. I hope that going forward, the government will no longer ban movies, withdraw book grants, that let's be big-hearted. We reached a stage of political and cultural maturity when we could accommodate you know, different points of view. <laughs> it's a plea, it's a plea. No one should feel demonized in Singapore. No one should feel demonized in Singapore. We're a diverse society, we have to respect each other uh, and make sure that uh, whatever our views on specific topics, there's a solid core of shared aspirations and beliefs that holds us together. So let's take questions from, from you. Um, who would like to ask the first question? Um, IPS colleagues, please help me. Yes, right at the end of the room. Can you? Yeah, hi, hi. hi, DPM Thaman. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. There's an echo. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I, I yes. can. Yes, thanks. So uh, Paul Tambaya from the medical school. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not an economist, so I, I can't talk about the economics in, in, in such a, an articulate way. But uh, to me, inequality in Singapore as, as a healthcare professional is actually a matter of life and death. And I think you may be aware of the data from the Singapore's registration of birth and death uh, from 2017, where if you use uh, ethnic group as a surrogate for income, um, the average age of death for Chinese Singaporeans is 78.0 years, compared with 70.6 years for Malay Singaporeans. Now, this is a gap of 7.4 years, which is greater than the gap between Caucasian Americans and African Americans. It's also greater than the gap uh, in the UK between uh, uh, minority groups and, and the white uh, uh, British okay. population. Yeah. C can you frame your question, please? So my question is, in, in a setting in which Singapore has got such great inequalities where people from lower income uh, die 7.4 years before people from high income, don't you think that there's something that we need to do about the structural factors which are contributing to this life and death uh, problem of inequality. Thank you. Good. Uh, useful question. Well, first, uh, uh, 
whether speaking as an economist or those in the medical field who are epidemiolog epidemiologists, um, I think uh, you should be very wary of uh, single factor correlations. Um, so I don't think it is income per se uh, that leads to a lower lifespan, but a whole set of other factors that may be associated with income. And of course, here you're talking about ethnicity. It is well known, uh, be it in the medical literature or in the economic and social literature, that there's a whole complex of factors that are bound up together. And I'm not talking about the specific example or ethnicity you're talking about, but everyone knows that lifestyle, diet, habits, exercise, the job you do, all of these matter. People who do tough manual jobs uh, have more problems uh, it, with, with healthcare and their elderly age than those who do white collar jobs. Those who worked in the coal mines in Britain mm -hmm. uh, suffered from uh, numerous more chronic problems in older age compared to those who worked in offices in, in, in the city of London. Uh, all these factors matter, but it isn't just income. So we've got to address the different factors mm -hmm. that contribute to poorer health outcomes in, in your latter years uh, and address them in the most practical way. If you ask me, we have a real issue with diabetes. And when we say that, it means we have a real issue with diets and habits that are formed early in life and persist through life. Uh, and we have to take that extremely seriously. So these are practical issues in public health that we have to be concerned about. Regardless of income and ethnicity, they are real issues that we have to be concerned about. And when it comes to social uh, factors and family factors, it becomes a bit tougher because you actually have to intrude in lifestyle issues. And that's why it's so difficult, but we have to. We have to as government and community help persuade people and incentivize people and nudge people towards healthier lifestyles. Thank but you. you know, Singapore fortunately doesn't have a situation of you know very dangerous vocations or life or or, or, or uh, jobs um, because we are a very urban environment and it's uh, it's generally not one that puts people at risk. So it's really largely a matter of upbringing and lifestyle, and we have to work much harder at it. Um, give give other people a chance, yeah. please. Yeah. Another question from someone else. Uh, yes, Gillian. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, DPM. Can you speak louder? My question is this. It has to do with what more we can do for the low-wage, low-skill workers. We have a system, a progressive wage model, instead of a minimum wage uh, strategy. And that progressive wage model is a wage ladder that is paired to skills, which the government has invested in heavily as well. My question is this. Sir, what is your assessment of the progress that we've made using the progressive wage model? I suspect that there will be a lot of discussion tomorrow about whether we should consider a minimum wage model if we just cannot see a lifting up of the people at the bottom to uh, absolute progress and relative progress as well. So just your assessment. Um, and the broader question is this. I think in the room there'll be people who say, let's invest more in the quality of opportunities. Equality of opportunities. But on the other hand, there'll be others who say, if the report card is no good, then let us do more in terms of establishing the quality of outcomes and think about, right now, sexy ideas like universal basic income. So over to you, DPM, thank you. Thank you, your Jill. assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Good. Thank you. So I think the issue of a minimum wage should be treated as a uh, practical issue. Uh, uh, it's not an ideological issue for us. It's a practical issue. And in fact, the progressive wage model is in the same league uh, as the minimum wage. Uh, we basically focused on the most vulnerable, those who jobs, whose jobs are renewed by contract. And these are those in the uh, in contracts that are uh, in the in an industry that is largely outsourced, where they are outsourcing contracts, cleaning, security, uh, and what are called landscape workers, you know. 
those who look after their estates and so on. Uh, has it worked? Uh, if you take our cleaners, uh, uh, five years ago, the uh, average wage of a cleaner, and this is quite a large group of, of workers, um, the average wage was uh, a little over $900, and today it is over $1,200. So more than a third increase, an increase by, by more than a third in five years, quite significant. Uh, for security guards, uh, the increase has been, in fact, even larger, uh, uh, more like 36%, something like that. So very significant increases uh, within a short space of time. But very importantly, as you've highlighted, it's not just setting a floor, but it's, it's uh, uh, designing a ladder of wage increases based on skills and experience. Uh, and it's working quite well so far. Uh, and we'll have to see whether we need to apply it to more jobs in future. But focus it on the vulnerable and make sure we know who we are trying to help. The trouble with the minimum wage, and I say this is a practical issue, it's not a political debate in my mind at all. As a practical issue in the US and elsewhere, is that a lot of the people who benefit from the minimum wage are not people from poor families. They may be youngsters or spouses or anyone who happens to be doing a, a, a job at the lower end, but a very significant proportion of them come from uh, middle-income families or even better off. So it's not very well targeted. By focusing on cleaners, security guards, and landscape technicians, we know who we're trying to help. And by the way, this is a group that is especially uh, uh, populated by our older workers. Our older workers especially are disproportionately present in those three jobs, especially cleaners and security, and security guards. So it's one of the ways in which we've tried to help our cleaners, our, our, our older folk who are in the workforce. But the most important strategy, and I have to emphasize this, when we think about all these issues, whether it's minimum wage or progressive wage model, our most important strategy has to be to keep the escalator going. And it means staying competitive, developing capabilities in our economy that will hold us well in future competition, and very importantly, keeping the labor market tight. Keeping the labor market tight does far more than any social policies will do. Mm -hmm. That's what leads to wages going up over time. And keeping it tight for every category of workers. Not so tight that employers simply can't find workers at all, because then the demand for workers goes down and Singaporeans suffer. But keep the market tight. That's the uh, 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 strategy that ultimately is going to lead to wage growth, productivity growth, and that escalator keeps moving. Um, DPM, as you know, I'm an advocate of a minimum wage, but I, will, I don't want to debate you tonight on this right. issue. Um, we're running out of time. We have five minutes left. So could you, in about three minutes, sum up what is your most important takeaway from our friends? Well, I think what's, you know, the nice thing about these debates and the, and the questions we've had, all the questions, is it shows that we are concerned about these issues. We are concerned about inequality. We are concerned about social mobility. We are concerned about every aspect of it, the healthcare aspects, uh, income aspects, whether we take the trouble to interact with people from all walks of life. And that's not a bad starting point, that we're all concerned about this. The government is concerned, the NGOs are concerned, the, the academics and think tankers are concerned, and the public is concerned. Singaporeans, by and large, are by nature not very class conscious, and they like to make sure that, that no one is doing too badly, and that we can all do well together. And I think it's very important that we preserve that. And I say this not just because it's a good thing in its own right. It's a good thing in its own right that we should all take an interest in each other and want everyone to do well. Mm -hmm. But I also say it because it is one of the ways in which social mobility is sustained. The culture of our interactions, the ease with which we interact, and the way we treat each other, whether we treat each other as equals as we grow up, and as we go through life, also shapes social mobility because it spreads aspirations. Mm -hmm. Aspirations shouldn't just be the province or the, uh, uh, the habit of the upper middle class or the wealthy. Aspirations spread through interaction and by having a common culture. And the social mixing, 
is something that also enriches those who start off from better off homes. That social mixing enriches all of us. And that's the beauty of social mixing. It enriches all of us. So let's keep that in our Singapore culture. Because it's a good thing in its own right, but it also helps us to keep aspirations moving up for everyone and each person taking an interest in the other in the same classroom because we are sharing a desk beside each other, in the same basketball team or in the same team at work. Taking an interest in each other is what helps the whole team to move up. Keep the escalator moving up because that's the best way you can get social mobility on the escalator itself. Thank you for that important message. Um, DPM, you were recently in Bali for the annual meeting of the World Bank and IMF. And I noticed that at a meeting that you chaired, you summed up by quoting a famous economist, Elvis Presley. <laughs> so I, I, want to, I want to conclude this evening by drawing inspiration from your example. So I want to close this evening by quoting from a famous philosopher whose name is Bob Dylan. In, in an important essay that Bob Dylan wrote called The Working Man's Blues, he wrote, and I, I, I read, there's an evening haze settling over the town, starlight by the edge of the creek. The buying power of the proletariat has gone down. Money is getting shallow and weak. The place I love best is a sweet memory. It is a new path that we trod. They say low wages are a reality if we want to compete abroad. Will you please join me in thanking DPM Talent?